by now I have turned the screen share on as you saw and thanks for reverse heads up um, dealt with the microphone. I um, will not see the chat comments and you know one of the special features of such an online tutorial is that I have zero um, interaction with you the audience so please use the chat and the other um, co-organizers moderators will pick that up and, uh, and, and alert me so yeah welcome to this um, this is this is novel for me in the sense that we opted to do this for two hours because online live streaming is hard on everyone it will be hard for you to you know stay alert for two hours and follow so we'll have a break in the middle but the good thing also is there will be a recording so we can we can replay this um, i've taken the material from what is usually a three hour session so um, I have a hundred slides. We may not be getting to the end, but I think that's not that's not the end of the world. Um, if there's sufficient interest, we can. It's just online. We can just resume and do a Roman two with follow up material. But otherwise, I will try to give you a nice intro. And again, the um, the link is at the bottom. That is live. That's at my website, so you can get to the PDF um, as updated yesterday already. So let's get started. But before we do that. Um, big thank you to everybody in St. Louis for the main USR 2020 conference that, of course, we could not hold because of the events of um, this year and the COVID-19 epidemic, as well as the, uh, and that's the first for us, oh, nice typo there, USR, not ISR, um, satellite conference in Munich, um, you know. As, uh, as I'm a bit involved with the R Foundation, we have a little bit of oversight to these user conferences, so we're quite pleased with how everybody could recover from that. And with that, also a really big thank you to the R Ladies groups, um, having picked up the slack on um, and, and forwards, I think, as well, for the tutorials and organizing these. So mine today is co-hosted by Santiago Valparaiso and Concepcion, as well as the R user group in Santiago. So thanks for doing that. And with that, let's get going. So. Um, RCPP is about 10 years old, uh, a bit older now. We had the 10 years anniversary a uh, year and a half ago, so 11, 12 years. Um, I've done these tutorials a few times, um, and there's sort of certain flow that, that makes sense. Um, so even though everybody, I guess, in the audience is already an R user, I'm going to recap a little, you know, why we're regrouped here, what makes R special, and what some key salient features of R are of which extensibility is one. And uh, going with C++ is, uh, is, not a, is not a bad choice. So that's basically um, motivations. Then a little bit of empirics, you know, is it used, is it widely used? We had a, a really decent um, benchmark passed just a couple of days ago. And uh, then uh, along the way, I'm easing into how one actually gets going, uses it, and does some usage illustrations. Um, while I'm at this, uh, often when we do these in a classroom, you would be sitting there with your laptops and exercising. And you know, one thing that is uh, a little tricky, if you haven't used it before, we're now going towards using a package along with the compiler. So what I usually say is uh, a really good test, we'll come to that in the slides as well, is, uh, and I'll, I'll come to this particular function as well. We have a, um, and I'm nervous presenting, even though I've done that a million times, so that was a typo, this is what I meant. Um, I'll be covering this again, there's sort of three key functions, but the simplest of them all is a simple evaluator, we call it eval CPP, it evaluates an expression in the C++ context, and we can use this as a litmus test for whether your compiler and system is set up. If this works, we're actually taking this, and I'll come back to this, and it evaluates two plus two and really compu com computes that. But if you see an error, then you just know that your system isn't quite set up. If that's the case, a really good fallback alternative, still full featured and unlimited and free till next month, when a pricing scheme recently introduced comes in is rstudio.cloud. That is the URL. So it's the host rstudio and the top level domain cloud. And you can get in there with a GitHub ID or a Google Gmail ID and single sign-on. And you then will find yourself in a cloud-hosted RStudio server instance on the Linux box where also all compilers are set up. Now we're just going to be tricky in varying this and you'll see that it's not a um, fixed expression. And um, 
see this one I actually hadn't prepared, but everything's on the system. So we have to install um, RCPD first. This will now go a second. The system sort of has to wake up, get its motions in with the Docker container, and then we'll do that. Um, uh, but we'll come back to that later. We don't really have to um, have to wait for that. We need to get that out of the way. So that's that's basically setup issues. You know, in a in a live tutorial when we sometimes do that, we have a helper roaming the room who can who can help you with the um, with with the installation. We don't we don't have that here. Uh, if you have any graver issues, um, see and now I can bring this back. Um, it's actually there. Now if you run the exercise. Um, there's mailing lists and other support, but we, we don't really have the time in the in the scope of the tutorial. So with that, back to the overview, and the first topic is sort of why are. Um, I'm a reasonably old uh, and long-time R user, but when I came to R at the end uh, of mid to end of the 90s and 2000s, and even at the time, long-time R user was Pat Burns, whom I had the pleasure of meeting a few times, he goes all the way back to um, before R when S plus was still done at Statstoff, where he first worked after his PhD. Uh, Pat is a consultant who runs burn statistics and the author particularly of a booklet. Some of you may have heard about the um, R Inferno, which is a really excellent free PDF write up about some uh, um, corner cases, intricate details, things worth learning about R, but because he's an R consultant, he, of course, also evangelizes for R, and he, when I was, you know, doing this revision of the slides and looking around how would you motivate R, I remembered his website and went back there. So there's a really good set of about, you know, why use R, what is R, what is the R language, and why would we use R? And, you know, us who already have already, you know, taken the pill and fallen for the course, we, we know its strengths. It's, it's not just a package, it's a, it's a language. And it really is operated, it's, it's designed to operate in a way that we think about problems. It's a language designed by statisticians for statistical problems. And it's both powerful and flexible. Um, it deals really well um, with these statistical problems because it's, it's interactive. John Chambers called that turning users into programmers. There should be a really smooth transition from, from working a little bit with data to exploring, which has to do with graphics, of course, there's much more solid support for things like missing values and other features uh, important for modeling. Um, everything's done really as functions and function calls. The packaging system is really strong and as Pat points out in this um, 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 set of bullet points from a few years ago, community is really a strength and we all know that here um, given that we're in an event hosted by the R ladies. So really what is R? R is programming with data. And it's really strong as ingesting, aggregating, visualizing, modeling, and reporting in just about any way, shape, or form. I think of R as a, as a middleman sitting in all types of data flows. Just about anything you can have on the left-hand side in formats can be converted into just about any um, output on the right-hand side. So you can be going from binary data in various forms, databases, free or commercial, text, stored, what have you, binary network, you name it, and present it in ASCII, text, PDF, websites, dashboards, web front ends, what have you. It just does all of that. It's really a central point, a central place, a central middleman for programming with data. Or, um, you know, I work in industry, and often we're not in a single language environment, it is also a really good player as one programming language in a concert with others. Uh, so why R? What's the historic perspective? Where did it come from? And this one's, um, I, I treasure this quite a, quite a bit because I think it was very early on, I think in, in 2011 or 12, I had an opportunity to travel to the West Coast because of the Google Summer of Code where I was mentoring as I am again this summer. And a couple of the mentors, uh, or a couple of representatives of E-Team get invited to a mentor summit at the end. And uh, that is, of course, in the neighborhood where Stanford is and where John Chambers lives. So other than, uh, so, so because it was clear that I was coming there, a couple of the R users at Google reached out and we had a meeting the day before and discussed. And John had just given a talk 
um, a week before and had used this, um, this slide, which I hadn't seen before. That was 10 years ago. And the funny bit is, and I'm going in circles now, as of last month, actually, that very um, um, slide, that, 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 that drawing, that sketch is now in a paper uh, in an ACM collection on history of programming languages, most excellent. The DOI is at the bottom, it's also the bottom of this slide. And it's from frigging 1976, May 5. So the, the vision of how we should compute with data and the systems that we would like to build is, is decades old. This is a quest that has consumed, I mean, well more than a generation of statistical programmers. So really none of the questions and problems are new. And a lot of it, um, you know, has been, has been framed and phrased and analyzed and also implemented sometimes, sometimes with detours, um, sometimes straight away. So uh, um, the article goes a little bit more in detail around this, but basically what people and what the context was back then when at AT&T, at, um, at, at, at Bell Labs, um, um, which was, um, it's, a bit, it's almost hard to remember, which was really unique at the time because the um, telephone companies weren't broken up. There was one national monopoly, which was making, of course, money hand over fist and could support a very large um, amount of research efforts at the time. So um, this is like, you know, the, the equivalent of Google Brain and Google Research and a couple of those um, back then in the day. It's also the home of Unix, the C and C++ programming languages, and they had um, a really, really strong statistics and statistics research department of which John was a member. And they were thinking about a new system for statistical computing. And they wanted to have basically something that made it easier for the analyst to interface with canned routines. So what the, scan, the sketch here described is an, is an inner Fortran algorithm, because everything back then when was Fortran in the pre-C and C++ days, that is accessible through an, um, a subroutine that provides access to it, and that is then called XABC, the interface to ABC. And the rest of the sketch has to do a little bit with how information could flow to the routine and back with, with little designs, the, the, the intrinsic aspects of it are not really that important, but um, the sketch really has a, has a very special place in my heart now, not only because it's so old, because John was then a very sweet and very generous with attribution and actually already then eight, nine years ago, framing that RCPP was really um, the first project at um, sort of, not putting words in his mouth, what did he say? Sort of fully or completely implementing this vision in providing uh, an interface from an inner implementation language for us C++ and an outer um, user interface. And we'll, we'll, we'll see this. But this basically predates S, uh, which picked up a lot of these ideas of giving an interactive uh, prompt interface to, to combine routines behind it. So, and again, um, now you just not only have me rambling with a borrowed um, sketch from many, many years ago, uh, John put that uh, in his own words, and it's a good part of this, uh, this article of uh, 17 pages that you, that you find there. Um, how did the world evolve after that meeting in 76? Well, there's markers, and many of them are actually books by John Chambers. So this one um, came the following year, 77, and is still all the way in Fortran routines. Um, then there was a first... Um, departure towards S, but that one was, how shall I put it, retracted or revised or seen as not that great um, um, a solution. That's the so-called brown book here in the middle. And I'd forgotten that it was there. And when I gave the talk with these slides back in London a couple of years ago before this book existed, Pat Burns himself reminded me that I actually skipped one. But then the evolution really came that the new S language, so this blue book, replacing the brown one was the first one describing the basics of, um, of S, the language as we, um, as we now know it. And important uh, additions were made in the subsequent book. So this is Chambers and Hasty, and this one, statistical models in S introduced things like LM, the formula notation in LM with the fact that an, that an object comes back from the fitting routine, formula and other things, uh, white book. Um, then um, 
a couple of years uh, later came, um, uh, this was in uh, late 90s, 1998, still only S, and John at that time, I think not quite an ARCOR member. This one introduced the S4 classes, um, which became very important. For example, Bioconductor is built entirely on S4. And then there's a 10 year break. And this book came, by that time, John's a member of ARCOR, and the title no longer talks about S, but has in the subtitle of the title Programming with R. Really excellent book. I enjoyed this one a lot. Um, already has a um, strong sort of historical view and description of the evolution of language, and one that is really dear to my heart, and where John sent me a couple of uh, uh, preprints that I went over before it came out. It's from 2016, um, Extending R, because that's really you know, close to my heart and what we're doing here. And we'll be getting to extending R in just a second. But I really liked um, SODA, Software for Data Analysis, from 2008. It has two chapters towards the end, Interfaces 1 and Interfaces 2. But it doesn't really make a point quite as strongly as uh, extending R then, then does. Because extending R takes two um, lines that uh, many of you know or have seen that John has described earlier actually in, in SODA as well. And when I asked him whether that was the first place, he kind of said, no, 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 those, those sort of were around, but we, we don't have a clear starting point to that. So basically these first two main descriptions were that everything that happens in an R session um, or everything that exists is an incantation of an object. Everything is an object. And every change, every alteration, every computation that you do around objects is a function call. And those are really, key important um, descriptions um, at the, for, for, for the very core of what R is. And then this book added a third one to it, interfaces to other software are part of R. And that's a really fundamental change if you think about it. Because beforehand, you know, we might have come to S and then R as statisticians not really knowing other languages. So we mostly dabbled in R. Uh, we're quite happy doing things in R. And now sort of the statement really is made that, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think of the world as monolingual. If something is done really well in another language, it's natural for R and, um, and important for R to be interfacing to it. What this book then does is that it goes um, and, and contextualizes that for, I think he calls it programming in the small, medium and large and goes to three different two different languages in three different interface ways. Um, and the three are um, uh, Julia, Python, and I always forget whether Julia comes first or Python comes first and how the two of them are done. One's done with remote procedure calls and the, the Python example is done with a predecessor not yet reticulate, but the, the current support package is used with reticulate. And then basically Roman three, the, the, the main part for programming the large is going with C++. So there's a, there's a big endorsement. Um, and John also contributed some code to, to RCPP. And here again, I'm highlighting this. So, you know, um, programming in the large complex projects um, require a broad and flexible setup. No single language or software system is likely to be ideal for all aspects. Interfacing multiple systems is the essence. And, um, that's uh, what gets us to C++ because, you know, if you're really serious about extending R and willing to make that commitment, you may as well do it with um, RCPP. And before RCPP came, the main mandated way of doing things was, um, can't highlight with the mouse, almost uh, jumps to the next slide. So sorry about that. That's sort of the third time that happened to me now. So I'll stop this. Is, um, uh, once again, sort of a second iteration of an interface, there was an earlier function dot C that just used um, uh, basically C atomistic objects, sort of ins, double, or pointers of those, if you know what that is. And this one then is, is bigger, richer, and more powerful, and by now really the one that one just used. And everything happens with so-called S expression pointers. And these are basically abstract representation of the things that are there and are the objects. And the nice trick is that the S expression encompasses all of those. And what RCPP then did uh, was basically add a very powerful generic way to deal with all different variables of these S expressions. And that's basically um, 
what we're doing here. So um, it's, it uses an old C programming trick from the 90s before OO. It's really, a, it, it's a union type with a bitmap that describes the type of representation it is, whether it's a list or a numeric vector, things like that. Details we don't need to know really because RCPP shields them, but that's how it gets to that. There's a couple of internal ones behind it, sort of things like, um, uh, or, or things that are still accessible, even uh, environments, function, and, and then a couple of others that aren't directly exposed. But the, the key thing to um, keep in mind is that um, RCPP is basically the magic potion that allows us to deal with all the different types from, uh, from the C++ side. And um, I'll, I'll show some examples and put more, um, more beef on that statement. Um, <clears throat> and one of the reasons we're using C++ is that C++ has language structures that makes this unpacking of the SHDs particularly powerful. But RCPP, C++ is generally just a useful language because it's, it's fast. It compiles down to a really efficient uh, code that is really second to none for other systems. That's a, that's a design feature for C++. It aims to be both, if you want to use it that way, functional enough to be able to reason um, somewhat abstractly in it, almost like functional programming, yet at the same time be so efficient that it sort of crowds out and doesn't leave space for another language you would interject there just for performance reasons. So uh, Jan Stroestrup, as the creator of C++, is very adamant about that point in, in, in talks as well. So it's, it's uh, uh, all the way down to the machine level for efficiency. Um, it's also old and widely used and had a really beautiful renaissance. Um, you know, sort of um, at one point uh, around the year 2000, you know, Java was coming up, was seen as the next, next thing. Then C Sharp came, it wasn't quite clear how C++ would respond. And um, things got, you know, reformulated, new initiatives got started, and uh, um, the new C++ standard for um, C++ 11, which missed the year uh, 2011 by a few years till it was ratified, was sort of a really big response and, and rebirth. And now the language is again you know, really actively developed. Uh, there are newer standards, and uh, it's 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 fairly fairly vibrant. Um, but decades worth of use, so many libraries, many tools, very universal. You will likely not find an operating system or uh, or machine that you can't use it on. And certainly, wherever R is used, you also have access to C++. The combination um, of R. And C++ and RCBP, we find hit sort of a nice sweet spot. It's, uh, you know, of course you're going away from R2, another language, so there's a little bit to learn, but it's really, it's not as complicated as going full force into C++. Um, R still helps us and is a great host because build and uh, operating system specific uh, complexities like linking are taken care of by being embedded in R. It's fairly expressive because as I'll show, we can do things that we as R users um, have gotten really used to. Um, if you have a vector, you have expressions on the vector that take the vector as a whole. So for example, if you have a vector X, the sum of all elements of X is sum of X. Whereas in some other languages, you would have to loop over it, access every element explicitly and, and sum up by hand. Uh, seamless. This, what I, what I mentioned earlier, that all these internals of R, vectors, matrices, lists, uh, environments, functions, um, get uh, access because we can un unpack the S expression pointers, the SEXP so well. And because C++ is performant, um, RCBP is pretty performant and it allows us to, uh, to extend things. So it's a, it's a pretty potent cocktail and as, uh, as we've seen over the last couple of years, it, uh, it got a good uptake. Um, so this was sort of somewhere around 2008. Um, I started running a script uh, near daily or then daily that basically writes down the, um, the SQLite database. I think that's where I store it for these, for these uptakes. It's the, the number of packages using it. And JJ reminded me that at one point I was in Boston. I think I was running the race there as I've done a few times. So it must have been one of one of these, one of the last time, and I think 
he reminded me that I had <clears throat> a really broad smile on my face and was proud, um, you know, as a young father saying that, oh my God, we have whatever the number was that 30 or 60 packages using it. So the uptake was, was relatively slow. And you see that there's a little bit of a structural break here around 2014, not quite sure what caused it, but the slope became much more pronounced. Um, I could go on about this chart forever because there's a couple of really interesting tidbits hidden in there. When it gets really jagged and it jumps up and down, this was right in a January and that happened again this year. That's actually Cran taking out the broom and uh, throwing a number of packages off Cran or e even more than usual. That, that happens a bit more than it used to at other times. Um, here again, so an app looked like it flattened, and then uh, again, sort of this year, it's, uh, it's it's reasonably steep, so it's 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 quite nice. When I started putting the second chart behind it, which is the right axis of percentage of packages using RCPP as a proportion of all packages on CRAN, these two lines actually shadowed each other for a little bit, maybe around this time, but then that also changed. And this one's quite interesting now because you could almost see sort of an S curve here as it often happens with cross curves because clearly there's an upper bound to how many packages we can we can hit but I blocked about that just a couple of days ago because we hit two numbers that I was watching we've now crossed 2000 which is just completely mind-boggling I mean there's just so many packages and uh, another one that I was looking at is it's past 12.5 percent so one in eight packages on CRAN uses it and that's uh that's a really just just a, a compliment and expression of faith of the community in what the package provides and, and continues to do so. So it's, it's, it's very humbling. Um, so updated this, I think, yesterday, and it was 2013. And of course, whenever CRAN admits things, these numbers change a little. So I think as of this morning, it's 2014. Bioconductor is somewhere between 2003 and 2005 it differs a little whether you look at bioconductor release or develop and uh, a hard to know or unknown number of projects on github gitlab other places closed source project at work what have you so it's 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 pretty widely used um this um came from a presentation that andy devries um gave at a use a couple of years ago when i was in the audience and had not seen this before the computations are based on a package of his which is always on github i think it never made it to cran for whatever reason and he's encoding the logic of the Google PageRank algorithm, which um, once you look at the details of it, is just a uh, you know, um, singular value decomposition uh, application. Once again, it expresses the graph of who refers to links to in the web page sense or in the package sense uses. And the outcome of that is actually uh, pretty strong. When he showed that a couple of years ago, I think we had, uh, we had just, or had, already um, arrived at, at pole position. And oddly enough, the, the gap to the next one still keeps increasing over the years, which confuses me a little because you'd also think that something that is used sort of just about everywhere, like, I don't know, Nita or, or Roxygen would be stronger, but then somehow we're still far out here. And then in the next few ones, sort of some things have changed. I think ggplot was, when I first made these charts a little behind Mars, now it's slightly ahead, but you know, there's a strong effect, of course, clearly of tidyverse things, as well as um, uh, recommended packages, Mars, Matrix, and then it just uh, goes all the way down. Uh, MVT Norm, I think, used to be a top three data table, one of my favorites is there, and ACPV Amadeo that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes is also on this list. And I think I arbitrarily cut this off at 30 so that the Access labels are still readable because after that it gets pretty boring and uh, it's, a, it's a relatively fixed percentage. One new computation that I was able to do since, or more easily since um, R, uh, no, was able to do at all since R340. R340 gave us this function, CRAN package DB. Um, I, after 20 plus years with us, still get a bit confused between the tools library and the utils library, and it's sort of slowly dawning on me. Uh, tools a bit more for what CRAN itself uses for dealing with packages, CRAN itself, package installation, tests, a lot of the R command sub functions are implemented there. And tools, CRAN package DB basically returns to you one big honking um, object with as many rows as their packages as CRAN. And then I think it's 65 columns. 
of which one important one that I didn't really have access to beforehand was the yes or no toggle of whether the package needs compilation or not. And that basically means, does the package have a source directory, which may be C code, Fortran code, um, Rust code, uh, I don't know what, or C++ code. And we, with that, basically get the proportion of how many packages actually do need um, compilation um, out of the total CRAN packages. And as of, uh, again, two days ago, that was about 3,900 and a few out of 16,000. And that then allows us to compute out of those that need compilation, how many use RCPP. And when I was starting to compute that in this slide, I think uh, following R34 and a couple of years ago, I think we started with low 40s and it's been steadily creeping up. And it was a really big deal for me too when this hit 50% a couple of months ago, because it now means that among those packages that are elaborate enough to involve uh, compiled code, one out of every two uses RCPP. That's, that's actually, um, pretty much the strongest expression of usage and, and uptake. By all means, you're not required to use RCVP and we can do everything sort of the standard way as well. I'm not, not saying anything here, it's just the empirics show that we uh, seem to provide something that enough packages um, find useful to use. So um, it's good, it's nice to have these options. Um, and then basically, so that was, uh, sort of setting the landscape, um, why would we do this? Is it being used? And now let's get on to how do we actually use that? And with that, I made that um, earlier when we started pointing to about CPP, this way or the other way, a really good first test if you have to check that on your machine because you're suspecting that something may have changed or you're internaling it at first, is it actually working right or not? Um, about CPP, allows you to submit a really simple limited string, not a complete program, not a complete expression. It's not even assigning to a variable. It's just, just a part of an expression that can be evaluated around which RCPP with glue code, which is something it generally does, creates a callable function um, that's worked up enough so that it can actually be compiled, linked, and then loaded. And there will be some C++ code evaluating the expression that we give. And here it's two plus two. In what I've done um, in the early example in three plus three, uh, you can just use just about any expressions. And um, if the answer comes back as you would expect, um, then your setup is right. There's options to evaluate CPP um, where you can do it in verbose mode, uh, ask it to have it show you the little program that it sets up and writes and uh, all of those are good for, for checking. Um, there's a little bit more that you can do with um, RCPP and you can evaluate other expressions too by quickly you know, returning random numbers from C++ rather than from R itself, but it's, it's mostly a tester. And again, um, RCPP doesn't really impose that much on your R system that isn't already imposed by wanting to compile packages from source with or without RCPP. So on Windows, you will need to install R tools. Um, on Mac OS, you generally have a compiler, but that too is a little complicated. And I'm not a Mac user, so I mostly refer to the FAQ and blogs and, and write-ups. You need to get a setup as provided by Simon Urbanek in R Core for use on a Mac. But if you do that the right way, then it just works. And where I mostly work, which is on various Linuxes, on laptops, servers, or in the cloud, and compilers, basically always the end, it just works. And as mentioned, uh, a really nice um, solution accessible for everybody with a web browser is studio.cloud. Um, starting in uh, August, I think you will be limited to a number of hours per month, but it's still, uh, it's still quite nice to have that as a, as a fallback. And uh, if you'd rather use that than buy a second computer, it's still not a bad value proposition. I think it's a, what did I say? I think it's $100 a year for a more, um, more generic setup, which, uh, which is not bad. I've used it twice with a class I taught and it's, uh, it's really quite, quite nice. So um, 
there's really three key functions in RCPP that permit you to access compiled code. The val CPP is the simplest. We've mentioned it before, it just takes an expression. You can also use it to um, look at what, on your particular machine, the maximum value for numeric of type double, this is how C++ can look, which is a little scary, you've never seen it. And if you look at this, the number that comes back is what you get for a double. And it's actually the exact same number that you get back from R itself. If you look at dot machine, that's a subfield in there. It will have the same 1.79 E308 because 64 bit in a double, that's the upper range. Um, and with that, let's break maybe for a minute or so. And um, if you're set up on a machine, as I was, as I am here, um, just play a little with eval CPP and see um, if there are things that work, don't work, how you can break it, and just uh, just get your feet wet and create some compiled code. And I'll uh, take my clock now and maybe come back in a uh, in a in a minute or so and continue. Alrighty, maybe um, let's uh, let's get back to this. It's really a bit limiting that I can't have immediate feedback from the from the chat, but uh, um, it's um, uh, I hope you got a chance to um, um, to pick something um, something up there. The next function that actually begins to allow you to um, um, have some more useful C++ expressions is CPP function. It generalizes a concept that was introduced with the very useful inline package that RCPP relied upon uh, at the very beginning. Inline already allows you to take C, C++, or now, thanks to a contribution of Fortran functions, given as a text string and compiles links and loads them. And JJ saw that, um, liked the idea, and then generalized it a lot in something we call RCPP attributes, which gives us that, and then a bit more so CPP, which we get to in just a second. But CPP function basically allows you to take an entire string and submit it to R, and it turns it into a function. It's really clever because it does a little bit of parsing and grabbing. It sees from the submitted function what the name in the C++ language of the function is, and assigns that to an R object of the very name automatically. So if you write example CPP 11 here, it'll become an R callable function with the same name. Um, there are a couple of other uh, options and toggles. You can tell it where to look for particular headers, turn certain features on or off. This slide is now a little dated because um, before the current or even previous um, R release, you would have to opt into C++ 11 as a compilation standard. Since then, it has become um, the default mode. So R does that already for you. So this line is actually somewhat redundant, but I just keep it here to show how this works. And um, this is an illustration of what one can do with C++ 11. If you know a little bit of C or C++, and we'll get to that a little bit later too. One of the aspects of a compiled language is that everything is typed. So we're saying here that an int gets returned. Um, and one of the nice things that C++ brought is that the compiler gains an ability of determining the type of a variable from the assignment, because this variable is assigned 10 
not 10.0, it knows that this is an int and makes x an integer variable, um, which we then still have to declare at the return of the function because that wasn't in C++11, it's in the later standard, but small details. The main uh, exciting aspect for us is we can just say CPP function from, from quotes to end quotes and um, get a uh, R callable function with this code provided that runs that. And that's actually, um, let me do that actually real quick. Let me bring my local version over here because you'll see how that works. If I, um, you see that on this machine right now, I have nothing, the environment is empty. And if I then do rcpb c++ function, and I'm going to uh, do something simpler just to keep the typing simple. So I'm just going to say, I take a function that takes an int a and then returns the sum of a with itself. So 2a, uh, hold on, am I? Having my parents in the right space. Um, up, oh, that was my mistake. These wouldn't belong there. So that looks better. And when this compiles now, you see that in a second in the environment will pop up, plop, the function. And if you look at double me, it's actually, it's a little tricky. It's just really dot call, calling the code that contains this plus a little bit of glue around it. So um, it's, it's one level of indirection, but the identifiable object under that name is created from the name given here. And that is uh, um, really comes from um, uh, analyzing the code. So if we then said triple me and made it this, you would see that we'll get third function created and it'll look just similarly, there's a dot call to a memory address and the, the variable will be given. So very powerful, very useful, uh, quite popular. Um, and um, yeah, so there's, there's a little summer here. Um, and I have a suggested example here, sort of library RCPP, which is how you would do it if you don't want to prefix it with a colon that I've done. Um, try maybe for a minute now to write this function and then call it this way and reason over whether it works, yes or no, uh, or whether it would not work. I'll, uh, I'll set the same function up over here while I'll, while I'll leave you the screen and then we can look at that in just a, uh, in just a second. Let me uh, bring that back here. So I did that um, quickly. So that's the same function. And there's uh, basically one, one minor trick here. We'll get back to the, some, some other implications of this as well. We wrote this function as returning an int and taking to int. But when I'm calling it with f21 and 21, what am I calling it with? Am I calling it with an int? No, I'm not calling it with an int. I'm calling it with a double, a numeric. And the C and C++ language do casts um, automatically when they can be done unambiguously. So a real number of 21.0 can very easily be converted into an integer of 21. So that's the same as if I had given integers explicitly, just like this. 
But uh, what is less clear is when you actually don't have an int, then they get lost fully converted to an integer by being truncated. So this works, but it may not always be what you intend. So maybe you really wanted this function to be double A and B. So it depends a little. Another uh, useful trick, um, is that RCVV actually has enough machinery behind the scenes to pick up the fact that hello world is neither an in nor numeric and already a numeric didn't really satisfy the, 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 the expectations of receiving an int but the way the language is defined is that that cast happens automatically and you can't actually stop that um, but for things that don't pass, so a character string clearly is not an integer, an error gets generated uh, or an, um, get, it gets recognized as an error condition, um, an exception is thrown and it gets turned into an R error and it comes back to the prompt just, just nicely here. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't blow up, it doesn't abort, it allows us to continue uh, quite directly, which is, which is actually quite, quite handy. And yeah, and basically the context that I had implied here with the question was, you know, sort of uh, other cases where there may be complications and these corner cases have to do with when the types don't perfectly match. So that's really source CPP is then the next one behind eval CPP and CPP function. Uh, and it too is described in the one vignette describing uh, all of these and the machinery. And source CPP is the next level of generalization because it allows us to work on a whole file, which may contain several functions at once. Source CPP then reads the whole file, extracts all the functions in it, and provides them similarly to how CPP function had provided them. And just how CPP function generalizes a function from inline, so does source CPP. Uh, a key feature here are um, Plugins, uh, the plugin that we've already seen with CPP function, you can also declare those in um, for source CPP and bring in other packages set up to cooperate with RCPP, Amadeo being one of them, Eigen and another, and uh, possibly GSL the third, as well as toggles for turning on C11, 14, 17, uh, or the draft for C20, OpenMP, and, and more as documented. How does that work? Well, the easiest way really I find is to, um, and with that, let me, uh, show you again, I'm not managing to, um, um, to bring the, um, window down to size, but that's uh, well enough. So uh, a, an easy way to get a working C++ file is just in our studio, say new file and say C++ file, and it brings a pre-canned cooked file in with a little bit of comment. This is how comments get defined in C++ behind a slash with pointers to further resources. Our website, at least right up from advanced, are the RCPP gallery that I'll talk more about. And then there's a function here and this is how we declare those. So easiest way really file, new file, C++. Um, and with that, let me go back to the slides. Because this is what it brings in. Um, other aspects are that C and C++ files um, function by having uh, include statements at the top that declare basically the available interfaces, the available functions that, uh, that can be used. Hold on. That's better, let me move that out of the way and then try to make it disappear. Um, there it goes, it's gone away. Sorry. Um, 
include statements um, basically provide to the compiler information about what can be accessed. So that's very standard. And we set RCBP up in such a way that you generally just need this one, include RCBP. Um, then one thing that's fairly common, especially in code that you first write to experiment, maybe less on packages, you can say using namespace RCBP. And this is the namespace declaration in C++. As our users, we know about, of course, the uh, file named upcase namespace, where we can also do import declaration statement has the same effect here. When we do using namespace ACPP, we don't need to prefix RCPP entities with RCPP colon colon. Um, it's good for shorter files. I personally don't use it much when I program with RCPP. I like to be more explicit and have them in the source code, but that's, that's sort of depends a bit more advanced topic. Comments come behind two slash lines. Very important, the actual export via source CPP happens after a tag called RCPP export which is, for this version, written as a comment following the two slashes. And then there's one other convention. Um, C code comments um, are not declared line by line following double slashes. They go over a longer range following a slash star way to opposing star slash. JJ had the clever idea of generalizing this into slash. Star star what follows now is something that we should give um, to R, and that's actually um, super handy because if I now do, oh, I have to um, save this first. That's always the same because if it's not saved, we can't source it. Oh, and I mistyped, but to share. CBP and then source CBP and then temp and then meant to write demo file and have a dem file. Um, and of course, it's not source. I'm really in presentation mode and absent minded, but source is the thing I have in mind. So when we source it, it would take it as an R file, and of course, that doesn't work. But source CPP takes it as a C file. There was one function in here declared as exportable. And that one is now uh, listed in the environment as well. And this trick that I was just trying to get to was that this corresponds to, if you wish, to examples and or unit testing um, in a poor man setting, everything that follows um, the comment character and the meta character R is executed when source CVB goes over the file. So you could uh, you know, also, um, Put another comment in here, uh, then hit the button here, or uh, recall source CPP from the bottom. When I hit the button here, it prefixes it with RCPP colon colon. Otherwise, I can do it as well immediately. The um, command is also clever when the file hasn't changed. It knows that and doesn't need to recompile, so it's immediately there. So this now runs both of these commands. So that's source CPP, and that's the um, the third one basically of the. Um, of the key functions for using RCVP from, um, from the um, uh, attributes vignette. So what just happened, we defined a simple C++ function times two. It has a single numeric argument that was actually um, uh, a vector. The example function is years ago, we did it with a, with a scalar, but it's, it's easier with a vector. We hadn't actually even um, run it. So let me, let me run that real quick. So if I do times, Two and supply a vector of 20, 21, 31. I'll get all elements of the vector back as expected. Um, again, already, you know, vectorized operations at C++. We double a vector in a single one-line statement. Quite nice. As we recreate the wrapper, compiles links and loads it and makes the function available on both sides. Um, and with that, um, um, maybe do two things here. Let's have a quick break because I've gone on for an hour. Um, so let's maybe make this um, 10 minutes, have a coffee, go to the bathroom, but also at the same time, try to work with this a little and go to, if you're in our studio, uh, file, new file, C++ template to work off the file. 
otherwise go back to the slide and just type the few lines by hand. What's really salient, what you need is these two and these four. This is already optional. If you just put these two in a file, you can source CPP the file whether you created it or not, um, a studio or, uh, or not. So have, uh, have a go with that and um, uh, play a little with times two, make it times three, do another operation, um, add a third argument, uh, just do variations around it. And we'll um, continue in maybe five minutes at uh, I guess in two part the hour in in, uh, in second past the hour. Talk to you soon.
du coup. Alrighty, let me maybe slowly, slowly, slowly come back. Um, that was a fantastically timed um, uh, pause because being at home, as we all are these days, and on retail internet, uh, I'm in the US, uh, you know, uh, at the mercy, as many of us are, of Comcast, and they just, uh, uh, they, they every now and then come in and just reboot the system, and they seemingly just did that to me. So I was actually cut off from all of you for a minute or two, but now it's back. Sometimes I just use it to uh, update the firmware, and let's now get, um, get back to um, uh, the quick example. And uh, Gwyn in the chat had a really good, um, um, really good question running into uh, a nice example gotcha that can happen. So I'm just going to retake um, the question just to do a little differently. So the question there was if we, um, and I'm just going to, um, 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 do it for argument's sake on a on a scalar here. Um, we can then look at a at a vector as well. Um, so the question there was: when I just want to uh, take a value x and cube it, what happens? And you see here, um, you know, our studio is already helpful to me and yells at me that ah, that looks like trouble, brother. And if I source this now, um, we see. Another helpful example of our studio. Uh, our studio picks up the error message from the um, compiler um, and situates the error message right in there with the error and basically tells us, well, this didn't quite work, which was my immediate ad hoc um, reaction in the chat as well. 
Uh, cubing that way works in a couple of languages, but C and C++ are not among them. So if you want something to the nth power, you generally take the um, function um, pow. And this is another trick, and I'm running ahead a little bit of myself in later slides. We're now taking a standard C++ library function from the standard namespace and access it. If I now actually go back and do it more the way that the question was asked in the chat and do numeric vector on both sides, then it's no longer an atomistic C++ type, so I can't do standard POW, but I think this will work because we have, and that was a, a nice stroke of genius, um, well, we don't, uh, hold on. I thought we had that. Um, many functions we have from standard math are, uh, oh, sorry, my bad. Of course it works, but I can't have the same function under two names. Um, in a thing called RCPP sugar, and I'll talk about that really briefly and we'll get to that. So basically functions that we want to be available because we use them from our other places have been declared to work on the vectors. So here I did, th this basically is also standard valid um, C++ syntax, not just RCPP um, and um, uh, yeah, it's close to a C file. Whereas here we're generalizing that and working on the vectors, but we'll get back to that in just a, in just a second. Um, so let's go back to the slides. I hope you all had a chance to work a little bit on the examples. It's a little tricky, sadly, that we don't have the feedback loop all that all that well. So maybe we can just pivot that over whatever spills over from the tutorial to stack overflow or issue tickets. I just pivoted um, um, uh, and just answered a GitHub issue ticket as well. So that was basically um, the main gist. Eval CPP just for litmus tests, source CPP for quick on the command line, maybe interactive in the R session, short functions of just a few lines that you can type immediately, and then source CPP for something more elaborate and longer. Um, that's really how it works. Now back to that we have the how, back to, um, and you know, sort of, we started with the motivation of why would we want to do this. Now we just covered how one actually does do that. And now let's go back to the motivation of, well, you know, what's what's really the upside here? And one good example that provided a lot of um, material in use for many of these sessions is something that I once found late one evening sitting at the same computer here at home and looking at Stack Overflow. It was years ago and a fellow had written in R a function that implemented um, this mass equation, this formulation, which um, some of you will uh, undoubtedly have recognized as the um, Fibonacci sequence or Fibonacci recurrence. It's something really simple and elegant and recursive. It defines a function f of n such that um, n itself is returned if the argument is less than two. So for n equals zero or one. Small footnote here, sometimes the Fibonacci sequence is only defined starting with one. I follow the convention here of starting it at zero and a big hand wave is over the fact that we do all of that on not negative integers. So we leave the negative ones out so, so they don't enter and for simplicity we don't test for that. So the stop of the recursion is that for the smallest arguments less than two, we return the value itself. All other arguments will um, uh, invoke a calculation of the sum of the two preceding arguments of the same sequence. Uh, very small, very simple, and it translates perfectly into R code. So in that Stack Overflow question, the user, I think, already has something pretty close to this, um, but in essence, the same. It's an R function that we call F that takes an argument N. If N is less than two, we return that value N. In all other cases, we return the sum of F for the two preceding arguments. Great. We can invoke this on the sequence from zero to 10, 11 values. For zero, it's less than two, we're returning zero. For one, it's less than two, we're returning one. For one, again, we're returning one. Now for n equals two, this is no longer the case, so we're going in here. So n equals two is the sum of the two preceding values, minus one, minus two, so it's two. 
for three, it's the sum of two plus one. It's, it's, it's um, sorry, for the next one, it's three and, and then so on. Five is the sum of two and three. Three plus five gives eight and so on. So the recurrence grows, um, grows quite quickly. Um, why was that user um, despairing um, in the Stack Overflow question? Well, he was very ambitious and used a very high value of n already years ago. If we just go in and say Fibonacci sequence of 10, we see that 100 runs here with a simple old R benchmark um, take nine milliseconds. That's really nothing. But if we increase it just going from 10 to 15, so 50% 50 of the payload, we get a tenfold increase in speed. Instead of nine milliseconds, it's 94 milliseconds. If we do that again and add five more and go to F plus 20, all of a sudden it takes um, a full second or over a hundred times more than f of 10. Why is that? Well, the function is uh, more expensive than exponential because uh, for every invocation, the path that it has to compute is unaware of the um, previous path or, or duplicate path it has to retake for smaller arguments. Very simple, if you go in for f of seven, it's the sum of um, six and five. But for six, again, it has to calculate the sum of five and four. So many of these nodes get re revisited. So it's a really great um, um, example for memoization. And uh, that's a discussion that I use, for example, in the intro chapter of the RCPP book to go over that a bit. So, um, and he then had done this F of 30 or F of 35, and it may have been F of 35 and went off for over half an hour of a single call, and he was sort of um, dismayed. And this is a great example for making R look bad because the invocation of a Fibonacci is recursive and R for all its greatness and strengths has one known weakness. The flexibility in the language comes at the cost of some overhead in calling functions and keeping state of functions and their context, uh, the closing environment, sort of all of that. So it's, it's not the cheapest operation. So whenever we um, invoke, um, um, a recursive function will just basically tie, pay uh, pay a known high price repeatedly. So it's an example that makes um, alternative implementations that are fast, just as this one, look very, very good and better than in real life because it, it really hits eye at a, um, at, at a weakness. Generally speaking, the differences are not that, that great. Back to our motivation here, RC++, just how we had written F in R, we can write a function G, a variant in C or C++ code, just on scalars, in goes an int, out goes an int. If the argument is less than two, we return it. Uh, other than typing the function now, we also have semicolons at the end of the lines, but this line is essentially the same. If it's not less than two, we're returning the function itself, with the previous argument and previous argument, um, uh, the argument minus two. And we can wrap this in CPP function, which we've seen in the previous section, by just having it in between single or double quote, just as a valid string, invoke it again on zero to 10, and we get the same sequence of 11 values. Great. So we've validated um, that we get the same result. Now we can compare them in, in, uh, in terms of speed. So we're just taking f of 20, which we had seen was the most expensive one in the previous benchmark, taking about a second, takes still just about a second, but g of 20 takes no time at all. So we're having a relative gain of maybe 500 here. But as I conditioned when I started talking about this, this is not what you usually get. Um, on more typical problems, you can get 10, 20, 30 easily, on certain examples, 50, 80 times, um, it, it, it really depends. Um, switching tools, going to a compiled language definitely helps with a lot of speed, but getting the right algorithm matters just about as much. We can do the same thing again with the different benchmark, uh, wrapper micro benchmark, which gives us a slightly different table with um, quartiles and medians, as well as an ability of stricking it into autoplot and you see uh, um, you know, that it's really a very big difference. And every now and then these have tails because there's a, there's a memory allocation happening and R cleans up, but uh, that's that. So yep, for certain problems, uh, RCVP is 
clearly very compelling, uh, even though in our day-to-day -day work, we won't have, um, uh, we don't always have recursion. So the gain isn't necessarily from time to four. Um, Uh, because we're running late uh, and we're only having, um, you know, two hours instead of three, let's skip this example. You can try that one at home. Um, uh, one of the things that you can run into here relatively easily, which I hinted at here, um, is uh, um, that int may overflow. So you may want to switch this to double and double. So. I talked a little bit of C++, but I never really um, introduced it sort of all that well. Um, a little bit of context help because invariably you will you know, run into cases where you have to debug a little or something goes wrong. So how do we generally work with C++? Well, you generally need a compiler. Often it's G++, uh, for Mac users would be Clang++, and you have to feed the compiler often a minus capital I for include directory argument where it finds these include files. And when we then say minus C, given a C++ file, it will only compile, leading to the next step where we're linking, creating with minus O an output file. So this is the uh, executable one based on the object file created in this step, also supplying a directory where libraries may sit and libraries that may be used. So this is already a bit more of an involved example because we're using external library and these two steps. And this stuff can get tricky because where these places sit may differ between operating systems and all the rest of it. So it's really great that we don't have to do that because R takes care of all of that for us. But that's a bit of the context. One thing uh, that I already mentioned is the typing. R is different, it's dynamically typed. We can perfectly well assign 3.14 to X, following up with an assignment of foo to the same variable X. R doesn't care, it's just that X then changes. Storage mode here is a uh, numeric. After this, it's a character value. In C++, each variable before you use it has to be declared of a particular type. And you can either facilitate and enable this or that. A variable, generally speaking, cannot hold these two um, um, values um, at two points in time. You need two different variables for that. Or a so-called variant type, but that's, that's error term. We don't really concern ourselves with that right now. Common types are int and long for C and C++. In R, we only have int as a 32-bit int. Um, sometimes you go on 64-bit int that other languages have. Sometimes these int get uh, combined with the qualifier unsigned, limiting them to the non-negative space and the longer range. Generally speaking, an int goes from a large-ish, but not hugely large, negative number to just about the same number positive. You lose one because you have to represent zero in the middle. Uh, similarly, uh, and back when I was starting, people used to care more about floats as shorter numeric variables. These days, um, we all do everything with double because that's sort of the natural size on a 64-bit computer anyway, so there's uh, not that much that happens with float. Had a little bit of a resurgence with GPUs where space is more limited and shorter variables are used. We're still doing that a little bit in, um, in deep learning, but that's only really when you have to push to the middle really, really hard. And then there's characters, which leads to something like string. Um, generally speaking, all of these variables are scalars and natively there is no such thing as a vector, but it got added later with C++ extensions. Um, another important thing is that you can create classes. Class is something that C++ brought. C already had struct. Struct is, if you wish, a little bit like a list type in R that you can have composite type, several types uh, arranged, and really grossly simplifying and keeping it short in the interest of time. Struct uh, holds types, classes, generalizes that by being structs plus code. So we'll get to that in just a second. Control structures are very, very similar. As I said, C and C++ came from Bell Labs in New Jersey, as did R, so the similar wording. Blocks are um, uh, defined by beginning and ending curly braces, so it's similar. Functions are similar too, but there are differences. Um, uh, in R, we can call functions with arguments by name and in position. That's a little stricter in C++. Um, uh, 
uh, you can't skip uh, as, as easy um, elements in the middle. Uh, there's a lot to be said about pointers and memory management, but um, if you really believe in, in C++ and more modern C++ as an alternative to C with the um, things like types for vectors and lists, you don't really have to do that much memory management yourself if you use these containers correctly. So um, it's not as much as a scare and, oh my God, I have to learn pointers. Excuse me, I really get into it. But, but for some more advanced library building cases, of course, it's, it's useful. So really quickly about this notion of structs and classes and what object orientation is. So this is uh, basically something that would have worked in uh, C code already. We're declaring a struct date containing three ins. And just to show that what we use then here, because years, months, and dates cannot be negative, I'm not using an int, but an unsigned int, constraining them to be to be positive. We can then use a date in another struct, so we can nest them, just how you can have a list in a list. Here we have a struct in a struct. And a date can be used to define a person as a combination of a first and last name, an ID number of some kind, student ID, employee ID, or whatever, as well as a birthday. And you can then do one more if you're going from struct to classes, because in classes now you get a new tool to work with. You can shield the data. I can now say year, months, and date are private, which means from outside of the class object instance, I can't access them. Um, what is then often used is that I have a public interface with setters and getters. So I could set a date as the triplet combination of Y, M, and D, and then have three getters for get the three elements back when you do this in this case. So that's, that's a very basic sort of level um, introduction of, of what um, objects would be. Um, one useful thing that I mentioned in the beginning uh, for the motivation is that RCPP maps types that R has, an int, scalar, or vector. And, and reminder, again, R really doesn't have scalars. Everything is a vector. So an int vector in R becomes an int vector via RCPP in C++. Same for numeric, aka doubles. We have lists, functions, um, as well as uh, nested things. So that just works. So again, int becomes integer vector or integer matrix, if you want, double numeric char and strings as a character vector, booleans become logicals, and complex, not used all that much, um, uh, becomes a complex vector. So let's work with that a little. Um, so first example of um, um, working with the, um, with the vector, and again, this is just for illustrating some things, the teaching example is, Given the vector, how would I find the maximum of a vector? So uh, that's, if you wish, a reduce operation of taking a vector of uh, a specific but not yet defined length and returning a single element, which is the value of the largest in it. How does one go about this? Well, if the vector comes in, I can query the vector itself to tell me about the size that it currently holds. Uh, objects such as vectors are self-describing. That makes it very powerful to abstract this away. We don't really say just, oh, it's just a pointer to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to an array of doubles and then the lengths and we have to worry about that we're overrunning it or not. It's, it's much more, um, uh, much better contained. Um, so the vector can tell us its size. We then have to initialize the computation properly. So without any less of generality, the maximum value could be initial value. And then we loop over all other ones. And if we don't find the bigger one, the biggest one will be this value. But the general operation will be, um, and um, I guess I left one inefficiency here because we could have, if we assign the initial argument, uh, and again, indexing starts as zero in C and C++, not as one. Um, but then I'm again, I'm looking at all elements, so one too many because the initial um, comparison will always be false. So for each element I'm looking at, is the current value larger than the working value for the max that we have? And then we just pipe out to, um, to the screen that, oh, we got a new value and it is now M and store that value. And once that loop is over, we're guaranteed to have looked at every single value, compared every single value, and will have found the maximum. Again, loops in C and C++ work from zero to just below the number of elements. So if you have 10 elements, the indices will run from zero to nine. That's just how it goes. It's a zero index language. Um, so that works. So you can play with that. 
just stick it into CPP function really quickly, copy and pasting. Uh, you can even copy and paste from the PDF. And if you run that with four, five, and two, we now know that on the second comparison, five will be bigger than the previously assigned value of four from the initial element. So we see the printout now is five and it returns and gives us a value of five. You can play with that a little, give different arguments here, sorted, pre-sorted, not sorted, and, and see what it gives. But that's how it works with um, looking at max. Similarly, um, you could work with sums of columns of a matrix by going in with the matrix and now returning a vector. So instead of reducing a vector to a single element, now we're turning a matrix and returning a reduction to a vector of here the sums or the max, you can do other things. And here I'm showing you already one higher level of aggregation because we're going over a matrix I and J. So there could be two loops, but because we can work with um, vectorized operations, we really only have one loop over all the columns. So we're first <coughs> asking ourselves again, well, matrix, how big are you? And a matrix has um, member functions, rows and calls that give you this number. Uh, these countable things are often stored in so-called size T variables. It's just a variant of int, sort of minor detail, but you will see that relatively often because you're comparing against that. I also use size T now as a um, value in the, uh, the type in the loop. Um, Knowing how many columns there are, we can use that scalar value to uh, create a vector of calls elements for result, res. And then our operation is from zero to less than the number of calls. Look at every column and compute the sum of the column elements of the matrix and assign it to the result vector. Um, and we can return that. So that really what happens here and is pretty close to bread and butter stuff that you may do for real work numeric matrix and vector are the go-to types for matrices and vectors. Um, our common uh, structures for, for work, they, they also work on, uh, uh, they work on int, on float, as well as on characters. If you have text variables, we use svp colon colon to make the matrix very explicit and access rows and call dimensions. We used column to extract a column and sum to operate over it and that sum is internally vectorized and will go over the entire uh, vector of elements. And um, that again um, leads us to uh, uh, another example that maybe we'll, um, um, we'll skip um, in the interest of time, but you can take the stencil of the get max and just work with it a little and do other tricks, loop backwards, find the min, do the sum, just, just get a little familiar with <coughs> um, source CPP and the function operating on vectors. Um, going further, where can we go from there now? Um, especially when you interface other C++ code, you will um, often encounter STD types from the uh, standard types from the STL, the standard tape break library. And the most important of those is a vector of a given type. So a vector of doubles. And it's so important that we set up RCVP to seamlessly interface with these as well. Just how you can pass in a numeric vector from R and instantiate a RCVP numeric vector. You can do the same with the standard vector of doubles because that's how you know, algorithms you see in a book or paper may be described or you need to interface with a different library and C++ interface. And it basically works the same way because we called it size for the vector for the RCVP type because the SDL type has the same. And the operation is basically exactly the same. And I just skipped the uh, print to standard out here, but, but otherwise it's the same, we get the same result. And, um, uh, these are very widely used, so we support them. They're widely used in C++ code and libraries. There's just one minor caveat. If you go from an R object to one of these STL vectors, the memory content has to be copied um, once because uh, C++ uses its own memory management, very efficient, well implemented, all the rest of it. But you don't always want to use that. We have reasons in uh, R land and RCPP land to use the memory of the R object directly. So 
if you instantiate a numeric vector, no copy is made. That's also sometimes why we call it seamless. It's a zero copy uh, transition from the R object vector that you have in C++. It actually accesses the same R memory location internally. And if you make those changes in R, uh, then they come back to, uh, to C++. So there's a, there's a minor uh, performance difference here, but you don't really have to uh, worry about that unless you accumulate really millions of, uh, of calls. <clears throat> However, the fact that we're reusing our memory leads to a um, uh, tricky difference uh, one needs to be aware of. So let's go over this slide for just a second. We're having a really simple function that I call set second, set the second element, where a numeric vector v comes in and very arbitrarily, I just and unconditionally, I set v of one, the second argument, because it starts at zero, to 42. If I run this and assign one, two, and three to v, and say sec second v, and recall this is a void function, doesn't return anything, so the function doesn't print. What I'm printing then is the object v that I had before I called the function, looking at it after the function, as expected. One, 42, three. What happened here is a side effect. I'm giving in the vector v, I'm changing it, and the change is effective on the outside. And that really is a sword with two sides. I personally really like it because it makes these operations really efficient, but you have to be aware of it. It's a bit similar in spirit, if you wish, to how a data table is highly efficient because it operates by reference on the vectors and mutates them directly. Um, it is not as uh, computer science-y um, functionally clean because it doesn't treat this vector as immutable. Um, but that's just the way it's designed. What you have to be aware of, though, is there's one very important gotcha. Remember that I call this guy numeric vector of V. What happened when I call it with 1L, 2L, 3L? Because now what is this vector? It's a vector of integers. If I then go in and say set second of V and print V, I get back one, two, and three, not one, 42, and three. Why is that? Well, here's the trick. That's the typing and the casting again. This is an integer vector. The function wants a numeric vector. The whole sort of runtime system behind us has to create a copy of this integer vector to create a numeric vector, it's always been like that, that's just the way it goes. And it's then this distinct numeric vector that gets altered here, but because this was a temporary copy, it doesn't survive out on the outside. So be aware of this gotcha. This can be very confusing and head scratching. What happens here is actually documented and expected. But what happens here is that you don't get the documented and expected, albeit weird, effect because you will be working on a copy of the supplied vector. It takes a little bit to getting used to, so you may be sort of scratching your head now, but it, it sort of makes perfect sense. One has to work with the examples a little bit. <coughs> and I basically just gave you exercise six by, um, by discussing that. So a bit more than um, on particularly RCPP vectors. Um, remember that we wrote the teaching example to get the max of a vector. We can do much better by just invoking the max function on the vector. That is this sugar stuff that I mentioned earlier with POW. And we have a couple hundred uh, of those defined within uh, RCPP that just do the normal things under the name and behavior that, uh, that, that R has. So min and max, of course, also P min and P max and sort of things like that. However, they iterate over um, RCPP numeric vectors, so they don't automatically work um, on SDL vectors, on the standard vectors. So there's another extension package that deals with that, but the, by default, they don't. Um, having said that, so sugar is really nice and um, gives us uh, a little bit of uh, superpowers. I'm seeing that there's more questions in the chat, but sadly, I can't get to them because I was disconnected. I also didn't see the earlier ones, so, so later on that. Um, 
we have vectors, we have matrices. So you think you could do things like linear algebra projections or regressions with it, and you can't. That has to do with the fact that I once, as a young man and PhD student, worked a lot with uh, matrix libraries in C++ and learned the hard way just how involved and how much work they are. Um, so I shied away at the very beginning of putting all that work also into RCPP and kept RCP more on the flow of data back and forth. So if you want to do math operations, you're much better off relying directly on a specific math library, one of which, two of which we've actually packed pretty well, as the Eigen and particularly Amadio, now used by over 750 packages. So that one's, that one's your go-to case. Um, and great that we still have time for that. I'm, I'm aware, of course, that with the two hours, uh, we can't cover all quite as much, because I've given you about CPP, CPP function, and source CPP. The other key thing really is packages, because I don't want to leave you after this tutorial and all you've seen is source CPP, because then you feel like all the work that you do with RCPP always went to source CPP. No, 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 no. Packages are how R works. Packages are what you put to CRAN. Packages are what you share with your friends, coworkers, PIs, bosses, you know, aunts, uncles, everybody. So it's very important that you need to know how to work a package with RCPP. And luckily, because it is so important, um, we put helper functions in right in the beginning. So you can invoke RCP package skeleton. It generalizes the base R function package skeleton. And we have similar ones for a couple of the other packages. So Amadio has one, I can GSL. And another one is also in our studio, just how I showed you earlier how to get to a, a basic C++ file to experiment with. You can go in not under file, new file, but file, new project, and then a package. And I'll show you that in just a second. There's a vignette uh, on more aspects of this, because there's always a bit more that, can, that needs to be said than uh, uh, than what I have time with for uh, in, in, in five sentences. And packages really matter. And that's really how RCP got taken up. There's over 2,000 of them now, which is just huge. And over 200 at Bioconductor. Um, so um, yes, uh, I updated this screenshot in the older PDFs from the previous workshops. It was still one from years ago. So these are the colors that it looks like. Let me bring my current session over. So. Basically, if you want to do a package, it's really straightforward thanks to all the IDE work that our studio put in. You just go to File, New Project. It generally, uh, God, this annoys me so much. The, uh, the resizing, just, I, I always lose the bottom here. Okay, let's just do it uh, um, full screen. File, New Project, and then it generally asks you, um, do you want to create a whole new directory or work with an existing directory or do you want to pull something from Git or SVN? So I don't generally use new directory. And then depending on what you have on your machine, because I have RCPP and Amadeo and Eigen and RCP Parallel and also Shiny, I have a bit of choice here. So, but generally what I go to is either RCPP or RCP Amadeo. Then you just select that and say where you want it. And if I then say demo, this time type correctly with the P demo package. It's a subdirectory of, um, temp and then you can say whether you want you know to take over the current session or create a new one so let's just use the same one then you do that and da, 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 same works on um what you might call it now studio cloud you get a couple of files pre-created as a combination of uh, our basis package skeleton and ours so this one r still puts in and uh, then you basically see what's there and there's a very basic uh, hello world for RCPP that returns a list, something that we haven't got to, a list containing a numeric vector, a character vector. And similar, we also get one uh, um, just like that for um, for Amadeo with some vector ops. And I think that's what I have on the slides next. Or in the, yeah, exactly. So if you do that with Amadeo, um, being vector oriented, um, I made it a relatively uh, cute little example of taking in a vector where I explicitly say, I want this vector to be a column vector, not a row vector. If I explicitly see column vector, of course it's n by one. So if I do n by one times vector transpose one by n, out goes an n by n. And this is an outer product turning a vector into a matrix, whereas if I 
come in with a column vector transpose first and then multiply with the column vector, then it's one times n times n times one, creating a one by one. And then Amadio convention, if you want to assign the result of a vector matrix operations to a C++ um, a plain old data type, uh, atomic scalar, you have to explicitly convert this as scalar to, to, um, to, to be explicit. And uh, uh, in the uh, generated file, if you go to package, um, a file new project, project uh, there's a third one that then returns a list with both the inner and outer product. So that's something really nice to work with if you like or want to get used to um, Amadio. A uh, little bit of context here and a bit of hand waving because it's a complicated topic that is actually even more than a, um, than a tutorial length. Packages work really well if they're well enough contained. And by that we mean that if you want to use internal code, you can just take it all and stick it in the source directory and build it along with it. We did that, for example, once with RCBP ML pack using the one point series of the upstream ML pack, which uh, it just contains the full source of ML pack, which made it go stale too, because then ML pack had changes with external dependencies that we couldn't satisfy as CRANs, so this one then fell behind. And we're just catching up this summer, and that's the aforementioned Google Summer of Code project I'm co-mentoring, uh, where V3 actually brings us an update one uh, back again. In the middle, we tried uh, relying on an external library being present on the system, which works, but makes distributing trickier, because if it's not there, well, then you can't use it. MLpack is not as a library as CRAN, so this never built. For GSL earlier, um, and others were using it, so that one's there, so RCBP GSL can, can use on that. The trick there then is that you have to deal with the auto discovery of where the libraries are on the system and code them in your package. Um, RCBP GSL is a reasonably good example for that. Or a third and really uh, easy alternative, do what RCBP Amadeo does and pick C++ libraries that are template headers only. So these are libraries that are defined just in headers and don't need the linking. And uh, there's a bit more in a vignette. Um, RCP, we just had a package update to 105 last week um, where a new vignette got added from a paper I did late last year where I go over um, these steps in a bit more detail on how to create a package with an external to our library. So that's definitely a day two or three uh, sort of more advanced RCP topic, not really for today. And then just before we close, because we often we often want to do math. I should show you a little bit of RCBP Amadeo. This is a screenshot of a while back of its website. It's meant to look and feel like MATLAB, so highly expressive C++ that just looks like um, um, high level um, math uh, linear algebra code, so it's really neat. Um, good balance between high performance and ease of use. Uh, it's, it's very widely used, uh, as I said, over 700 uh, packages already at CRAN, but also millions of downloads for MATLAB and used in other commercial projects. It's on a very liberal license. You can basically do whatever with it. Uh, Conrad is very, um, very, very open to that. And if you should need it, you can also um, get a commercial license for it. And it's well implemented and performant and, and widely regarded. So there's a lot of documentation. We once wrote one about RCP Amadeo as well a couple of years ago, and otherwise um, Sanderson, that's Conrad, is the author of RCP of Amadeo, which we have an RCP Amadeo and Curtin is Ryan Curtin of MLPAC. Uh, one reason why we like MLPAC is that it uses Amadeo as its internal matrix and vector representation. And given that we already have RCP Amadeo, getting these objects to our um, MLPAC is a really nice, uh, nice extension. There will be more coming later in the summer. Uh, again, when you will work with these, you just have to say linking to, the package generator helps with that automatically, and there are many packages, small and large, that you can look at to see how they are set up. Um, how does all this work? Well, this takes up the earlier example of the um, column sums that are done with a numeric matrix from RCPP and numeric vector. So here we're doing the same in, in ARMA. Here I'm saying row vector rather than column vector as in the outer inner product example. Otherwise, it's very similar. The dimension information has slightly different names. So here it's a, it's a dot uh, and then uh, identifiers, but no colon. So it's not a function as part of the map object, but a, um, a, a 
slot a different data type, so a constant, you just access that, but that tells you how many columns there are in the matrix. In other words, the flow is the same of what we used before. You uh, create a vector of size calls, loop of all the columns, and sum the columns up. Amadeo 2 has high level functions that give you the sum of a column directly rather than having to look at every single element. I find the Amadeo documentation uh, really useful and uh, accessible. It's quite well done. Um, we stuck in an RCVP depends here at the top. That basically tells R that, oh, this is not just a plain RCVP package, but one that needs to go to the RCVP directory as well as the RCVP Amadeo directory to find the headers. And that's then all that it takes for a header only package. Um, as I mentioned, N rows, N calls are slightly, um, slightly different here. Um, and here we show Rovec, you can use a call back too. And uh, that's just that. And then, you know, other things are there as well. If you want eigenvalues, you just take eigen, eigen of a symmetric matrix and uh, much, much more. Uh, many examples at the gallery that we'll get to as well as um, for Amadeo itself and Amadeo's website. And you compare that with um, what one gets from um, R itself. Um, uh, there's a little math trick here. Eigenvalues are uh, defined by the values, but not the order. So this is the correct and equivalent answer because if you get zero and two back for this matrix, it really is the same as two and zero. R just has these ordered the other way around, um, uh, but they're equivalent. Um, if we had more time, I would let you work a little bit on inner and outer product of a vector, what we saw, a uh, little bit working with the transpose and the scalar, uh, which, is, uh, which is there again. And, and again, in a package, we just go to rcp amadio.package.skeleton or do it from RStudio from the same menu path I showed earlier. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, uh, you may have to do a little bit of extra work. Uh, at times, the photocompiler is out. At other times, you have to do extra work for OpenMP. So there's, there's always a little bit of, of work involved. On Linux, it just works and it flies, so no issues. Um, and in closing, one example to uh, um, of something else motivating that, that's really dear uh, to my heart. I first wrote this function when, actually I may have written it before we had RCPP or when RCPP was really embryotic and not quite there yet. There's a fellow who writes to the um, our help mailing list every now and then in Financial Economist, which was once my background too. And in economics, we sometimes worry about um, the power and size of tests and simulate them. And he wanted to do a lot of LN fits, but needed not just the point estimates, but also the standard error of these estimates to evaluate those. And that you can't get back from R's fast LN fit function. So the idea was to write a faster one, which I first did with RSVP GSL. And um, just not to give the story away, but that wasn't actually um, relatively disappointing what I got with, um, with the performance code. But anyway, I carried that on over to the other examples too. And this was the very first version that we had in, uh, in RCVP Amadeo. This was before we had um, uh, RCVP attributes contributed by, uh, by JJ, I think around 2013, um, a couple of years in, um, or, or 12, 12 um, uh, 13 was when, anyway, just about the time when the book was finished. So it just barely sneaks in. In the beginning, we still had interface explicitly with S, XPs rather than types. We had try catch blocks, all that went away. The next version then already is much more readable and concise because we're working in our direct types, but we're still doing a double dance that we're coming in with RCVP, vectors and matrices, that we're then assigning to um, Amadeo types in two steps. That was the way to do it efficiently because from R, to these RCVP types is zero copy. And then we set these ones up as zero copy by setting this false here as don't copy. And it took another iteration and some, as always, excellent work of Roman to make it the third generation. Then at the very end, we just had ARMA mat X and call that the Y, regress Y on X, goes directly through everything in ARMA types. The actual regression in MATLAB lingo is the solving of a linear system of um, X for Y, residuals then are Y minus X times core, if, as you would write it on paper, it's beautiful. We can extract the scalar six squared as the scalar of um, 
residuals transpose times residuals scaled by degrees of freedom, get the standard error estimate out, and with that can then return coefficient, the desired standard errors that Alan Fit didn't have as here also the residual element. Um, again, that was sort of a bit of the discussion how the interface changed and changed in performance. We looked a little bit at the um, performance between all of these. So this is basically for a small example, 5,000 calls. And these are all equivalent, not really changed that much. These were then alternate cases that are a little behind, but the big, big uptick is that when a little bit later, I try to be cute and not just provide these functions as matrix vector, but do it the way we like it in uh, R with Y tilde X and write it as a formula, the performance takes a massive hit and all the gains that we're getting from doing the regression in C++ are lost because we have to do so much R work beforehand to um, unpack the formula and create us the X and Y arguments out of there. So that's a really nice illustration again of be careful, measure, 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 and think through what you implement because sometimes you may do all the work to get a speed gain from compiled code and then lose it because the way you invoke the code is actually costly. So devil is always in the detail. And again, here, if one leaves these two out and just has a replication of the subset, all these runs on an example file, which is I think still in the package. Um, they're more or less equivalent, but the uh, more modern version with the const refs is as quick as the other quick versions. So that's basically all I had. Time is up. It's just further references now. So the package has a bulk of uh, PDF vignettes and help pages. Um, some of these vignettes have been through peer review and came out as papers. So RCVP and RCVP Eigen have one each in JSS. SVP Amadio, which I co wrote with uh, the Eigen, was with Doug Bates, uh, who uses Eigen in LMH4. Uh, the Amadio paper was with Conrad, who's in CSDA. And then James and I have another updated SVP intro in the American Statistician. Uh, there's a mailing list, which is pretty low volume and no nonsense that you should absolutely use. And for standard spam tests, uh, you need to be on the list in order to post. But I also fairly religiously answer solid questions at Stack Overflow. And there's a number of blog posts and other things throughout the world. Uh, another brilliant JJ idea was to set up a site called The Gallery. This predates uh, the Hugo and Blockdown days. Uh, so this was still built with Jekyll, but it's basically by now 110 or so um, little stories, particular you know, sort of two page descriptions of a particular problem and how to solve them. So I put initial how to use RCVP C++11 in and, and, and other things. So there's quite a few mails there. And uh, because it's been there so long, it has relatively decent Google juice. So when you search for something, it's, it's often there. It's a good, good resource. I have a book out that you can get from Universal Library or order directly. Um, expands on some of the things that I added here and provides a certain amount of, of detail and, and juice. The examples are still mostly in uh, before attributes. So attributes is just covered a little, but that, that doesn't really take away from the, from the general coverage. And then um, here is my usual final slides with the link to where all the presentations, including this ones are, my website, where you can get me by mail, on GitHub, or by Twitter. And that's really um, all I had. Um, and yeah, with that, um, I think I'll just um, close, hand it back, uh, maybe keep the Zoom open and try to hit a, a question or two as I can here or else invite you to uh, ask them at Stack Overflow or the, or the mailing list. So um, that's all I had. Thanks for hanging with me for two hours. Thank you, Dirk. We still have an, an, an answered question on the chat that says, what is the difference between RCCP and STL vectors? Yeah, I saw that out of the corner of my eye. I mean, I said that really um, briefly in the slides, but over two more minutes, it's really, uh, you have to sort of step back and come and, and realize where they defined it. Sort of STL vectors are the C++ vectors. Um, professionally rewritten, written, rewritten, reviewed library code that you can't get any more efficient than it is. So that is always what you should use as a vector. It has lots of guaranteed, um, it has guaranteed performance um, uh, characteristics due to its implementation, but it's 
it's the C++ one, and it will live with its own memory allocator management and all the rest of it. So in order to get them to and from R, we always have to invoke a copy, but that's just the price of the transition that we're willing to pay because it's very important to have access to them. So you can instantiate them directly um, from R via RCPP to have standard vectors of int, double, um, um, complex even um, in, in other types. And it's, it's very important because a, a lot of C++ code is out there and will expect you to hand it say an STL vector or an STL list and, and maps and the other ones that we, that we cover as well. But they live in different spaces also physically in the instantiation, which makes the implementation slightly different and makes them uh, closely interoperable, but not entirely. And so there's limits to what you can do. I don't think we ever, uh, you know, allowed you to, to mix. You can't just say RCPP vector Y equals sum of, you know, X1 and X2, where one is an SDL and the other one is an RCPP vector. So basically, if you don't need the SDL vectors because the code that you're writing to solve a problem is self-contained, you're expressing everything in the RCPP vectors, you may want to stick with those. But whenever you're on route to interfacing via RCPP to other libraries, you probably want the SDL vectors. So they have slightly different goals, aims, scopes, and certainly implementations. Um, but in order to be comparable, they have a bunch of identical operators. So I mentioned size and length um, because the SDL vectors have very well implemented operations that append at the end or at the beginning, um, push back, push front. And those are big O of one operations, the way these vectors are implemented and have the memory laid out. We offer the same functions for the RCVP vectors, but warn directly that because these are R objects, which have a simpler representation in memory or R headed when we wrote them 12, 13 years ago, uh, appending a single element and growing them is expensive. So you shouldn't use pushback and push front on RCPP vectors, rather SDL vectors. So if you need to dynamically change their size, you're better off with SDL ones. So the, the devil's in the detail, but it's, a, it's an important question. It's a deep question and among the 2000 plus you know, stack overflow questions, there will be at least a hundred dealing with the, with the SDL vectors. It, it, you know, it requires a bit more study, but, but, but by and large, they're similar, but distinct and distinct for a reason. I hope that helps. We have uh, three more questions on the chat. I don't know if you prefer to read them. Yeah, I can see them now. So let me, um, um, yeah, so how do I manage pointers? Um, that's loaded um, because I said in the presentation earlier that you generally don't need to know about pointers because you get these SDL containers or our um, RCV containers. So for example, I showed you when we did the um, column sums of a matrix that we just acquire the int of how many columns there are and then assign a result objects and say a vector of that size if the variable is called n. So no pointers here and everybody uh, and, and no memory management explicitly. I just say, if this object has 10 columns, I now need a result vector of 10 columns. It's, it's dynamic, it says runtime, it operates with it and I don't have to manage anything really behind it. So in that sense, that's automatic. Uh, there's one more to it. If you actually do need pointers, there's also RCPP types to deal with pointers. R has a concept of external pointers and we deal with them as well because sometimes you have to do more involved work. But basically for the simple stuff, it's covered and automatic and you don't have to go there. And the more complicated stuff is possible. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, uh, yeah, Joachim's question to call an external library. So that's basically in two hours or three hours in the workshop is really too short. I mean, I really, I mean, one day I should just do a, a, a webinar just on external library. So basically you have it there because that's one of the three cases that I had in three bullet points. Um, taking a full copy and sticking it in the source directory is definitely one way to go about it. It does of course require that all um, ingredients needed to compile those external libraries are already present. If that library itself depends on something else, well then you have a recursive problem. So if it depends on 
QT or GTK for GUIs or you know some other sciencey stuff, then you have to bring that in as well. So that, that can be complicated. Structs and classes um, are handled. You basically I have um, an ability to write auto converters for the way in and out. We call that as and wrap. S converts in, um, takes something from R and then represents it as your type's object. It's a bit involved, but entirely doable. Um, some of the uh, packages show it. RCB GSL shows it to take R vectors and stick them into GSL vectors. And there's an entire vignette on that topic. But again, that's um, it's, a, it's a really tempting one because you may have an interesting library and want to bind to it, but it's, it's not the easiest. One good write-up is, uh, uh, is on the RCVP gallery under the title of custom S and wrap um, converters, taking a relatively simple struct. But, but in essence, um, the magic of RCVP is that the C++ compiler will invoke these translators for you automatically each and every time. You don't have to do anything, but they have to be there. So you have to write them in the first place because we wrote them for things like Amadio. In RCVP Amadio, you kind of just say, well, you know, on this interface, I have a numeric vector. And the compiler will just say, sure, here you have it. Um, so you basically, you have to fill in for things that the compiler hasn't seen, uh, libraries that we haven't set up, the missing link to connect that library and our representation. And if that's there and was written correctly, then it just works and it's magic. And then you could say, put it on crime, or publish it, and write a paper about it, become famous, and whatever. So there's definitely a mechanism for you to implement this, but no free lunch. It's not automatically written for you. Uh, I think that was the third, right? So, um, all right, good. Yes. Well, great questions. Um, thanks for everybody for sticking to the end. Uh, for those who didn't, this will be taped, so you can get it canned in a while. And again, the links are there. Um, uh, come uh, and ask on the mailing list, Stack Overflow, our package develop, other places. We try to help as we can. As we can. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us. I just put the link to the other tutorials uh, on the chat in case you want to join uh, one of those. And thank you, Dirk, again uh, for joining us today. And thank everyone. We're going to post the link to the video in the next few days and the links also to the slide on the meetup so you can check them there. So thank you, everyone, and see you in another moment. Bye. Thank you for being a lovely host and setting this up. Thanks so much. <laughs>